Welcome to Eschatology Matters, part of the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. I am Jacob Tanner, and it is an immense privilege to have on the show with us today, Alan S. Nelson IV. Alan S. Nelson IV is the pastor of Perryville Second Baptist Church in Perryville, Arkansas. That's still right, right? That name hasn't changed. That has changed. But that has changed. Go, go ahead. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I don't, that's, go ahead. What's the no, name? it's okay. No, a year ago, we changed it to a little, just over a year ago it's providence baptist church that's what i thought and i got really I, I got concerned when i read that i was like that's not right anymore unless it is maybe you're pastoring two churches uh <laughs> so now it's it's providence though that's right yes sir and and you have the really cool thing uh, i've seen picture i've not been to your church but i've seen pictures where it says christ is king right or christ the king yep. how do you have that across christ is king yeah christ one is king. guy one guy wanted to put christus rex and uh, and I was like, look, dude, we're we are rural Arkansas. Everybody's going to see that and they're going to think of a dinosaur. You know, I was like, we don't speak Latin around here. So let's just do that, Christ is King. So that is pretty cool, though. I I might steal that because I, I like the Christ is King. But I was like, I can't do it now because Alan's done it. Also, we're renting our building. And I don't think uh, <laughs> the landlord would be too happy with us if we did that. But, you know. Maybe he would be if he thinks it's about a dinosaur over the top. <laughs> uh, so here's the weird part. I would normally introduce our guests completely, but I always feel weird talking about their families. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your family life, church life, rather than me sure. talking about you? Well, yeah, that's that's fine. Since you okay. already you already messed up the name of the church. I don't, you know, I don't want to let you mess up my yeah. family. Well, you know, Alan S. Nelson the <laughs> fourth. I I just don't want to mess up anything else for you. Yeah. So I am. So everybody in people think this is funny. I, I think they maybe think I'm making it up, but like everybody I'm a I pastor in my hometown. So I graduated here in 04 and we moved back in 2016. Everybody here calls me Quattro. And it's just because Alan Nelson, the fourth, but like my dad, he's a member of our church too. His name is Alan, Alan Nelson. <clears throat> everybody calls him Alan. Everybody calls me Quattro. So it's just kind of a, a weird, weird thing. Um, I guess if, if anybody's listening and doesn't know, that's Spanish for four, uno, dos, tres, quattro, which I kind of say it with more of a, a Southern hick, quattro, you know, but that's what everybody calls me. Uh, I'm married to uh, Stephanie. We have been married next month, 18 years. And we have, Lord. amen. We have six children. I uh, really, I think, I think we're, finished but we have uh, our oldest is going to be 17 soon and our youngest uh she just turned one and then i've i've already mentioned it but i've pastored here in my hometown um since 2016 it's actually my third pastorate but i really hope this is the plan to stay here so we've been here about eight eight and a half years now and um i hope to look back one day and say we've been here 48 years or however long the lord allows so that's just amen Three boys, three girls. I guess I didn't mention that. Three boys, three girls. Married eighteen years. Pastored here now eight and a half years. And um, yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. Uh, and you also have a connection. Do you want to talk about your connection to the seminary? Uh yeah, sure. I'm. I am a graduate of Grace Bible Theological Seminary. So I did. I did a lot. A lot of work uh, with Southern. But when I knew that the seminary was starting up, and uh, and it was just right here. It's about thirty-five minutes from me, and I and I'm uh really I'm uh, really appreciative of Jeff Johnson, and so I was like, yes, let's do it. So I finished out uh, two years with I took the thirteen-year seminary plan, by the way, just <laughs> life things, church things. I was actually had to leave a church one time over Calvinism, and it was just messy, and so like lots of things over the years, providential things, and uh, so it took me a while, but I finished with GBTS. And now um, that was in 2021, and now in uh, 2024, I just started working in admissions with them. So I'm very grateful for what's going on. It's, it's a church-based seminary, and they're accredited now. I think that came through 
last year or maybe the first of this mm -hmm. year with arts. And so I'm very, very grateful for what the Lord's doing at Grace Bible Theological Seminary. Yeah. And then if they want to listen to you more and th those sweet Southern tones, uh, <laughs> you have a podcast. Yeah, it's the uh, Rural Church Podcast 2.0 because we did it for like a year uh, and then we picked it back up again. So it's just me and another brother from Arkansas. Uh, he pastored about, oh, maybe about an hour and a half from me. We just like to get together and and um, and chat about things going on and and really like we're like rural church guys and like that's what we want to be and we want to appeal to that like we're we're for the church in all contexts but we just don't feel like a whole lot of guys are are talking to the rural church and even care like everybody wants to start there and get bigger but we're just okay. kind of like hey look God needs or God doesn't need anything sorry God has a plan for churches, uh, in, in small places too. So, mm -hmm. no, that's, that's helpful because I think a lot of the time what we've got is that sort of Tim Keller model in view. Uh, and I'm not necessarily a fan of Tim Keller, but when I was in seminary, that was, that was it, right? Like if you start rural, you don't want to end rural. You want to go to the city and you want to have the giant metropolis, uh, to pick from so that you can build your congregation. So, I love your podcast. I think that it's incredibly helpful. And I mean, on top of all that, you also do some writing. So you've written various books. Um, what's your favorite book that you wrote? Do you have a favorite? Oh, I, you know what? I really liked the recent book on regeneration, but I, I guess just the most helpful book that people have said is the first one uh, from death to life. Okay, and it mm -hmm. and basically how that happened was I was uh, just really hammering like you're not saved by the sinner's prayer. We got to stop the altar call, you know, stuff like that. And somebody said to me, "One, like I hear you saying all this, but okay, so how does how does it work then? You know." And uh, that conversation led to, you know what? I need to put I need to stop so much saying what we don't need to do, and let me just write out this is how it works. This is what yeah. it looks like. And so that's kind of a, I would say like a lay level primer to the ordo salutis, you know? Um, right. And, and it's been, uh, I, I've been really humbled and encouraged by the amount of people that have, uh, reached out to me, read that. And, uh, so I, I noticed, I don't know, yeah, yeah. I noticed though, that there's kind of like a natural progression there between that and then the book on regeneration, um, at least in my view, I read it backwards. I did uh, re the regeneration book first and then went back through those other ones. But yeah, so yeah. the regeneration one is a little more theologically heavy, you know, and yeah. it's like and it's it's still not like at the academic level or, or by any stretch. But it's it's just more of like, OK, let's really talk about. So let's really talk about the doctrine of regeneration and why that matters. Um, yeah. so that that's where that one's at. And then I, I wrote the one on, uh, the, my only other book, the third book is, uh, on, uh, on just reflections on the holiness of God. So somebody asked me to preach, a um, a couple of conference messages on Isaiah six and just the study of that. I was just like overwhelmed at, at, at the holiness of God. And there's already a lot of good books out there on that, but I just kind of, again, from like a lay level. So like my heart is um is is the people that i pastor and so when i think about them they're not going to pick up uh, and I, this is nothing against their education or anything like that they're just not going to pick up shawnox the existence and attributes of god that's just that's not in their realm of of what they see and you know what they do but but they might pick up a book like mine on the holiness of God. And so that's kind of the people I have in mind when I write or has been these last, the, the first three books. Oh, well, maybe there's another books. I hope. <laughs> yep. So, Amen. Yeah. Uh, so. I, I think you and I have that in common though. I, I know some people have said that it's a detriment for me. They say Jake writes at a really popular level, but that's intentional. Like I want just regular church people like myself really to be able to pick up a book and read it and it's not that i can't go more in depth i just think that it's more useful uh to be able to explain these things if, if you can't explain it to the five-year-old can you really explain it at all is kind of the way that i've tackled those subjects and that's actually 
what I really appreciate about your works. And I know that the book on regeneration is a little bit heavier, but I think that it's exceptionally clear and I think it's really accessible as well. Now, the book right now is across the room and apparently my eyesight's terrible. What's the name of the book again? Uh, the one on regeneration? Yeah, yeah. A, a, ch a change of heart. A change of heart. Yeah, change yeah of there's heart. a heart on the front cover. So that makes sense. Yeah. And I'm a terrible podcast host, so I didn't write down the name or get the book closer so that I could just read off the title beforehand. So that's great. Um, but that's really what we want to hone in on today is the doctrine of regeneration. And I think that there's a lot of confusion still surrounding it today. So like you, at one point, I left the church over Calvinism, um, was a Calvinist, church was not, had to leave. But what a lot of it came down to was that doctrine of regeneration. So let's start here. Let's just start simple. What is regeneration? What are we talking about? Yeah, and I just I just want to make it. I just want to make it clear. I, I I do think that you're a good brother, but your listeners need to know that you you did do a bait and switch on me. You you asked me to come on and uh, and talk about Christmas, and now here we are. Uh, no, no, no. We're we're, gonna, we're we're going to get to okay. that. That's okay, brother. I've got, a, okay. I've got a plan here in my head. Don't <laughs> just, don't Luna. It. It's okay. gonna. That's a spoiler alert. We're going to get to the Christmas stuff. So no, it's okay, brother. Uh, I, I uh, so regeneration. Is, and I'm I'm just I'm not going off notes or anything. I'm just talking off the top of my head here. But regeneration is that is that doctrine. Um, it it really finds its uh, one of the key passages. There is in uh, John three, obviously Old Testament Ezekiel thirty six, and uh, I, I'll give you a new heart. Uh, Jeremiah thirty one, the promise of new covenant. I'll write my law in your heart. But in John three, Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says, "You must be born again." And, and and of course, Nicodemus. The interesting thing is, Nicodemus is like, <laughs> what you know? And G but Jesus ends up getting to the point where he says, "You're a teacher in Israel, and you don't you don't understand these things." In other words, there's this idea that in the Old Testament, he should have he should have understood. So the doctrine of regeneration is what the Old Testament talks about in the circumcision of the heart. Mm -hmm. on what the old testament talks about and i'll i'll give you a new heart and then in the new testament uh, refers to it as um being born again and then in titus 3 the word actually regeneration is used there in titus i think it's titus 3 5 That's and right. so uh, it's the idea of of uh that that spiritual heart which actually obviously it's not the blood pumping organ like you see on the front of the cover <laughs> it it is actually uh it's actually a totality of everything about us the heart mind soul often used interchangeably but it's our whole nature being changed from hating god resisting god going our own way to now loving god serving god having the, his law written on our heart and um and just the complete overall so I'm rambling there a bit, brother, but that's that's it. No, no, that's helpful. And just for the sake of clarity, I was going to go to Titus 3, so that works out well. Uh, I'll just read the verses, Titus 3, 4 onwards. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So regeneration then is really the initial act that brings us to Christ. So let's go a little bit deeper now. Uh, there's a very popular question. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? In this case, in theology, what comes first, regeneration or faith? Yeah, so I think when we ask the question that way, so the short the short answer is regeneration. But mm -hmm. I, I I think that when we ask the question that way, um, it can be confusing to the popular level. Right. And so the, and so the idea is like, well, I'm regenerated, and then I, and then one day I have faith, you know. And it's like, well, that's not that's not right. It's kind of like turn on the light. So which which happens is the light come on or does the switch go up? Well, the switch goes up first and then the light comes on. But but temporally, there's like that 
that is happening simultaneously. And so one way to think about it is, yes, regeneration precedes faith. But another way to think about it is regeneration is the cause of faith. Um, and, and that these things from the you, you never have a, a <laughs> it'd be weird. You never have a an understanding of regeneration apart from faith. So no one's ever like, well, I'm regenerated. I guess I'm going to believe now. And I was like, no, it's 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 a from our perspective, certainly it's simultaneous. But regeneration produces faith. Regeneration uh, is 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 the cause, if you will, of faith. So um, I was just thinking about First Peter one three, you know, where God causes us to be born again according to His great mercy. So it's not. So it's not I give God baptism or I give God money or even I give God faith. And as a result, he gives me a new heart. That's that's antithetical to the gospel of grace. Right. Rather, it's I'm going my own way. I'm doing my own thing. And God does leave many to to that. God gives him over. That's the way you want to go. There you go. But. God, in his mercy and his grace and his plan before the foundation of the world, he has chosen to stop some people in their tracks and say, no, I refuse to let you go that way, and gives them a new heart by which they cry out to God for mercy. Mm -hmm. Amen. So. What I love about the doctrine of regeneration, and I'm sure you see this too, is just how interwoven and interconnected it is to the other parts of the order salutis. Uh, so, for example, you've already touched on it, but we can't really talk about regeneration without also talking about the doctrine of election, that God, by his free grace, calls us to himself. But if you don't mind, for a second, I'm going to play not devil's advocate. I'm going to play Arminian's advocate, and Let's I'm going to throw some questions your way from the sure. perspective of, you know, somebody who would deny Calvinism or reform theology, right? Okay, let's do right. it. All right, let's go. So I'm I'm playing a role here. Somebody's going to take this and like clip it out and be like, this is what Jake believes. This is not what I believe. I'm just, I'm going to play the role. Okay. So what you're telling me is God is a monster and he determines to send some people to hell while just for whatever reason he determines to save other people. What a monster this God is. So, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, First of all, that's a that's a that's a big uh, that's a big critique, and a lot of people have that. I think they don't they don't think through well um, God's omniscience. They don't think through well God's decree. the The reality is, most Armenians would say, you know, well, God knows everything. You know, well, that's right. But uh, and they would actually find themselves in the same problem. If I could just illustrate it real quick, so God knows everything. So God, no, let's just use um, let's just use Bob, Bob the Arkansan. God knows that Bob the Arkansan is going to reject him and go to hell, but He chooses to create him anyway. And uh, without any chance, you understand, if God's omniscience is true, without any chance of Bob being saved, Bob's going to be born, reject God, go to hell, and God creates him anyway. So the, so the thing I'm trying to say there is the so-called Arminian monster god problem it's not a it's not a calvinist problem it's it's a it's a god's omniscient problem like they have the same problem that they're saying you know the the but the answer for me the reformed baptist answer is like first of all uh, who are you old man to answer back to god uh s second of all I I love the way the 1689 confession says it but I, it's not equal ultimacy in in election and um and and uh reprobation re reprobation thank you and it's not the same you know I'm so the armenian not, helping you right now yeah thank you brother i appreciate that so it's early it's a saturday morning and uh anyway but uh so so the idea is god actively chooses to save the elect and god chooses sovereignly chooses to pass over the reprobate and so, so the point is, um, he lets the reprobate do what the reprobate wants to do. Uh, nobody wants God. That's the problem. Romans three would be great for everyone to just read and listening and listen to comprehend. There are not God seekers out there. No one seeks God. No one understands. They don't want God. If God were just to say, you know what? 
whoever comes to me will be saved, but I'm not going to give any grace. Whoever wants to come to me, I, I, this is hopefully not um, not not uh, a blasphemous to say. It. I'm just going to sit over here, and you guys come to me if you want to. Well, that the problem is no one would come to him. That's that's the reality, Armenian Jake. No one would come to God apart from his grace. So in, in his wisdom and in his grace and in his plan, he has chosen to bestow efficacious grace, and that's clunky, but grace that actually brings about the intended result, the intended desire. He's chosen to give grace to his elect, whereby their hearts are changed, they see their sin, they repent, they believe on Christ. Amen. But I'm still playing Arminian Jake. So hold yeah, on good. a second. Yeah, yeah, go. That's good. That's good. With, but within my heart, there is this, there is this aisle of goodness. And from within this aisle of goodness, there's this little bit of faith in which I am able to choose God. Because it, it just wouldn't be right if, if that faith was given to me. I, it exists within me. And I chose God. I know I chose God. How do you know I didn't choose God? Well, I, I would say this, uh, Armenian Jake, if you are a Christian, you did choose God. So I want to be clear about that. No, You cannot be a Christian without choosing God. So I don't want to lose that language. You must, and we should preach this way. We do not, by the way, we do not preach. Uh, we preach you must be born again, but we do not preach go out and be regenerated, you know, that's that's not we preach what the scriptures command us to preach repent and believe the gospel and so our Armenian jake if you're a christian it's because you repented and believed the gospel but what we're trying to say is we're we're, we're saying why did you repent and believe the gospel <laughs> because the grace of god was effectual in your heart there is no good in you there is no good so you see if there were good in you and it were that you chose to say uh, whether or not you would be a Christian, you were the ultimate decider, right? You were the final decider. So we'll take Jake and we'll take Jack. <laughs> so we got Jake and we got Jack. Jake says, I choose God. Jack says, I've got the measure of good in me, but I choose not. I've got that measure of faith in me, but I choose not to activate it. All right. So who gets the glory then? Who's the ultimate? Yes, God gets the glory. He does it all. Well, who who's the ultimate ultimate decider? Uh -huh. Well, it's it's uh, it's Jake and Jack. The reason you didn't become a Christian is because you just weren't smart enough. You know, the, let me just give this quick analogy. Mm -hmm. So the man uh, you you have a you have an overweight man. He goes to the doctor and he said, and the doctor says, "Look, man, you've got to lose weight. You're unhealthy." And so the doctor does all the work. He says, here's all the things you have to do. Um, he lays it out step by step. He even calls him every morning to make sure the guy's doing it and all that. But the guy loses, let's say, 100 pounds, and he becomes healthier. Now you say, look, that doctor, that doctor was instrument. Like, praise God for that doctor. But at the end of the day, the guy did the work, right? Mm -hmm. Uh he he did it, and if he would, and, and the reason that he's healthy is because he did it. Okay, but the the analogy we're saying is that's not the analogy. The analogy we're saying is the man is lying on the operating table, he's flatlined, okay, mm -hmm. and the doctor has to bring him to life. Now, no one would say, no one would say, well, the doctor did a lot of work, but so glad the man on the oper ta operating table did his part. No, he didn't. He didn't do anything because he wouldn't do anything. Well, that's the difference between the Arminian and the Calvinist understanding is the Arminian says, I, well, I, I got to do my part. I got to work. I got to do these things. And I'm the ultimate decider. And the Calvinist says, no, 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 no. You do have to choose God, but you're not going to choose God while you're lying there on the operating table flatlined. You're only going to choose God see, if he first uh, makes you alive. Otherwise, you're going to reject God. You're not neutral. You're going to reject God, and you're going to go your own way. No, that's helpful. That's good. Um, let me switch over to William Lane Craig Molinus, Jake, Ooh. for a second. Okay. And let's let's tackle it this way. Um, 
so what you're telling me then is that out of all of the worlds God could have created, God created this world because it's the best possible world when he was, you know, looking down through the corridors of time and history. He created this one because he saw that in this one, I would choose him. So I still get to choose him. It's him choosing this reality because it's the best one. But then there's multiple other realities where multiple other things can happen because of string theory, right? Wrong. Yeah, no. But I understand what you're saying. But uh, but again, here's the thing. The, the the problem is with all of these theories, whether it's William Lane Craig or whether it's the Armenian, and the, the problem is it's just not understanding the biblical data rightly. So what so here here's our options. We can start with man and work our way back to God, or we can start with God and try to rightly see man. And I think that the the biblical approach obviously is that we have to start with God. And we have to under we have to see what God has to say about man, and what God has to say about man is that our hearts are un unfeeling, uh, like fat. That I think that's Jeremiah or might, might, might be Proverbs. That we're dead in our trespasses and sins. That's Ephesians two. We've already mentioned Romans three. No one no one seeks God. There is no so. Give me an infinite number of worlds. Let's, let's just use Alan Nelson. Give me an infinite number of worlds and find one of them that Alan Nelson chooses God, and you won't. You won't find that world. There is no world that Alan Nelson, of his own faith, chooses God. Because apart from the grace of God, I do what the what. By the way, let's say this. I do what the Bible says that I do. Right. I reject God. I worship idols. I suppress the truth of God and unrighteousness. I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. It's not that I really want an opportunity. In fact, let me give you, let me say it this way. If given the opportunity, I would kill God. And I think that's proven 2,000 years ago in the cross of Christ. Yeah. If I'm given the opportunity, I'm killing him apart from his grace. That's um, true. So there's no, there's no, op there's no world that I'm choosing God. That's right. But now I'm going back to Arminian, Jake, again okay, for a okay. second. So I'm switching here on you again. How do I become unregenerated? Because I know a lot of people that have walked away and they were regenerated at one point, they were saved, and then they got unsaved and they lost it. Yeah, I think, again, that that is, uh, there's no such thing as unregeneration. You know, uh, Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 43, the Lord says, I work and who can turn it back? Mm -hmm. Um, so there's no such thing as I'm born again and then I become unborn again. There's no such thing as I'm part of the kingdom of Christ and now and then I become th there's no reality if Jeremiah 31, there's no reality where my sins are forgiven uh and I have the law of God written on my heart and then I and then that doesn't that that's undone Th this is actually um well i just say this for me and i don't you know want to get you in trouble or whatever but like this is for me like why i love being a reformed baptist i i believe we've got this right in the understanding of there's no one that gets in the new covenant in any capacity of being in the new and truly in the new covenant and then gets out of the new covenant so once you're in the new covenant you're in and you and you never get out but you are many Jake, you're right. You are right that there are that in this sense that there are people who seem to be in the faith who then leave the faith. So what's up with that? Well, it's not that they were born again and then they became unborn again. The reality is Jeremiah 17 9, the heart is deceitful uh, and, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Who can know it? So there are even cultural reasons sometimes that people will profess to be a believer. Um, and there's even this idea, too, we see this in America today. One of the greatest problems in America today is that we are guilty, but one of the greatest issues that we're facing is we feel guilty. We feel mm -hmm. guilty. So what are we going to do with this guilt? Well, some people try to drown it in um, drunkenness or drugs or maybe sexual immorality or, or whatever the case may be. But let me tell you this, there are some people 
who try to deal with their guilty conscience by dabbling in religion or even really being trying to be committed to religion. Right. And, it, and they sleep better at night. But uh, eventually the, their true colors show and, and they want their sin and, and they leave the faith. So that was a long answer, but they were never born again. No, no, that's that's helpful. And I think we can even go to something like first John chapter two. Yeah. And Good. so, hey, I'm I'm no longer Arminian, Jake. Now you've convinced me I'm back to <laughs> Calvinist reform, Jake. And I agree. And first John chapter two speaks to this. It says that they went out from us because they were not of us. If they were of us, they would have continued with us. But to prove that they were not of us, they went out from us. And I think that we could even look at some of the parables that Christ taught. Um, we could look to the parable of of the sowed seed, right? And one of the things I love about that parable and one of the things that's so helpful about it when you're explaining the doctrine of regeneration and coupling it with election and coupling it with uh, the, the perseverance of the saints and all of these different things, there is only one group where we see the seeds actually take root and grow and flourish. Every other group of seeds whether it's falling by the wayside or it falls onto the the stones or it's eaten by the birds, whatever, none of the other ones actually take root and grow. It's only the one group that does, which tells us there's only one group that's actually regenerated. And the group that's actually regenerated can't be unregenerated. Or to put it a little bit differently, those whom Christ makes alive cannot be killed. And I think that's actually a really helpful way of of looking at it. Something that I think you you draw out in the books, actually both books, pretty well. Um, this idea that regeneration is a a totality of what God is doing within our lives. And one of the things, this might be a stretch here, but you're gonna like this. One of the things, Alan, that I think happens is that in regeneration, it's like lights suddenly go on and that's that's the the analogy there of flicking the switch lights turn on and i think this is one of the reasons why christians love christmas so much because there are so <laughs> many lights you like how i did that i love it that's good okay. so let's talk about regeneration and christmas i didn't tell you that's how we were going to get there i didn't tell you this was the segment. Uh, regeneration yeah. and christmas what about regeneration makes you love christmas I don't even know if that question works, but go ahead and try to answer it so that we can talk uh, about Christmas. Yeah, I would say this, like, and I know, man, every year, I see it every year. I got a weird comment on Facebook the other day, or I mean on Twitter the other day about, I it, I get it every year. And so, so so now, sometimes the Christmas thing is like, I'm just trolling people, right? And like, it was like, don't you know Christmas trees are actually pagan? You know, I was like, that's not, I'm, I'm just telling you, Jeremiah was not addressing Christmas trees. Okay. So let's uh, get that out of the way. But, uh, and, and let me also say this, can there be idolatry with Christmas stuff? Of course, we can make idolatry out of, out of anything. Um, our parents, well, this may get you in trouble. Our parents wrong. If they lie to their children about Santa Claus. Yes. Can't do that. Like, come on, man. I mean, like, that's not what this is uh, about, but I will say this Christmas it's just, just a reminder. Maybe maybe I'm getting kind of Narnian here, and I'm not even like a big C.S. Lewis or Chronicles of Narnia fan. But, I am, so this is great. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So 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 the the idea here is we live in this broken, fallen world, and man, and it's just living in America right now. And there's so many worse places we could live, and uh, periods of history we could live. Yeah, we could live in we, Canada. <laughs> that's right Sorry, so you Canadian live, brothers yeah shout out Jacob Rayon but you uh you 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 live in this um in this broken fallen world you live in this very hostile time right now in American culture and just everything just the angst and the anger and the fighting and and but but you have Christmas is like this little reminder here this world was made for for something different right this, 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 there, there's one of the things I love about Christmas Day. I actually think that the Lord has given us 52 Christmas days uh, in in Sundays, you know. And I think one of the things that happens around here on Christmas Day is like Christmas Day looks like what I think the Christian Sabbath ought to look like. And that is like 
everything shut down, but like no one's complaining about it. Like no one's right. like, man, you know, everybody's like, let's celebrate, you know, let's, let's eat together. Let's enjoy our family, you know? Um, and, uh, and this year actually we're, we're going to have a worship service on Christmas morning. It's, it's on a Wednesday. So anyway, but, oh, yeah. but the awesome. point, yeah, I mean, I was like, but the point go on trying to long way around. The point is Christmas is like just a little taste of, of really, when you celebrate it rightly, when you understand it rightly, it's a little taste of what uh, what this world was created to be, and that is enjoying God and glorifying Him forever, and understanding you know our families are a precious gift from Him, the church a precious a precious gift and family, and so um, so regeneration. Now there are people who are unregenerated who like Christmas. I would just argue. They they like it for the wrong reasons, right. or, or or even uh, idolatrous and, and secular reasons. But for me, uh, regeneration leads me to embrace Christmas because I see like this is the most beautiful story. A story is not a great word because some people can you you know make believe or whatever. But this is the most beautiful reality. This is the most beautiful fact of anything that's ever happened. That God became man. To rescue a people for himself. The only way we're getting rescued, Jake, is if God comes to rescue us. And so he does in his son. And not to be born in a palace or to be some sort of um, uh, uh, platform builder that, like we see today. But he comes to be born humbly in a manger, the womb of uh, uh, the Virgin Mary. And uh, it's just, it's it's beautiful. It's, it, it brings my heart joy, brings my, uh, my emotions to, to, to tears, just thinking about the beauty of what God has done for us in Christ. So anyway, that's a, sp- a little spill there. No, no. Amen. I like it. Uh, so I actually, I don't think I've told you this, but I share your enthusiasm for Christmas so much so that when November 1st hits, I actually put our Christmas lights up outside. Um, and, annoy all of my neighbors with it. And maybe some of that is partially trolling as well, uh-huh. uh, because I know it upsets people because they're like, well, Thanksgiving has to, but listen, Thanksgiving is so much sweeter when you've got the lights on. Agreed. And yeah, yeah. It's just so much better. Um, but really I, I agree with you. And I, that's one of the reasons I love Christmas as well. One of my favorite Christmas movies, I have a lot of favorite Christmas movies, but one of them is uh, the Muppets Christmas Carol. Yeah. And I love that uh, final scene where he's up on Christmas morning and there's all of this joy and everybody's off of work and there's this feasting that's going on. I've always thought it's such a great picture of like Nehemiah 810, you know, mm-hmm. go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet and have joy because the joy, the, the, the strength, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And, and that is what we should be having every Sabbath. And there's this Great picture. Maybe this is cheesy on my part. I don't know. Maybe I'm talking more like Hallmark movie, Jake. Now, I don't know. But there's this great thing that's going on when the days are becoming longer uh, and darker. But there's all of these bright lights on all over the place. I think it's a reminder. It is to me anyway, of, you know, John one that the darkness has tried to overcome the light, but it just can't do it. So you've got all of these lights on. And then when you're celebrating it properly, when you're celebrating it for the right reason, these lights are pointing us to Christ. Back to the Christmas tree thing, what I like to tell people whenever they bring that up, I don't think it has pagan origins myself. I've looked at the history of it. But if I'm trolling people, I like to tell them, well, if it did have pagan origins, uh, it's always the victors that get to claim the spoils of their enemies. And of course, Christianity is victorious. And so we've claimed all of these pagan things for ourselves. I am decking my holes in the spoils of the enemy, which always gets people going. Um, And there was this, I don't know if you saw this, this was a few years back on Twitter. There was this guy saying like, yeah, if you want to say Christians just claim everything pagan, yeah, we Christianize it, that's fine. But if you don't stop it, we're going to be taking Shark Week pretty soon. That's going to become a Christian <laughs> holiday. And then people are like, stop, stop. And he goes, that's it. Toyotathon is next. Toyotathon is now a Christian holiday. Uh, but I think there is, again, something beautiful about that when we consider what God is doing in this world. So we consider regeneration from the point of view of what God is doing for us in salvation. But what about what God is doing in the creation? Is there a regeneration 
that we're looking forward to in the creation as well? Yeah, you know, I so I just let me say this real quick because I think what you said was so beautiful, and it's like I think it is analogous to regeneration. But I, that's what I that's what I've said about Christmas lights too. Like I w I wish if if I wish I had so much uh, money I could just make my house be seen from space, you know. But I like the idea of it's dark. It gets dark around here in the winter by by five o'clock, mm -hmm. and it's a long darkness. But you drive around, it's like, but wait wait, there's lights, there's lights here in the world, there's lights. And it's like pointing out that the light has come. Well, well with regeneration, that's the same too. We live in this dark world and uh, with this evil world. And it's like, everybody's out to get you, it seems like. And everybody's, you know, we live uh, in a society right now that has absolutely idolized autonomy. I can do what I want, my body, my choice, all these things. Like, is there any hope? Well, re regeneration are these, these little lights out there now in this dark world um and they've gathered together under proper leadership in local churches and these local churches are little lights little cities if you will on the hill and so i see uh, i see that connection um there so uh i'm always going to belabor the point on christmas when you let me but uh but your your question i think is good um so so my my hope uh my hope for creation my ultimate hope so I, i'm this is my eschatology you know i'm um all all meal um my hope for creation is the new heavens and new earth but that doesn't mean to say that god is not uh working in the world today through his church you know it's the church it's a church that um i'm all in you know this brother but i'm all in on the local church and so um i'm saying that what god is doing in the world today is 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 the church and um so uh and, and it's the church's responsibility to to take this message of hope and i'm saying like we're awaiting we're awaiting this hope like all all creation is going to bow the knee to christ you know all creation is going to uh is going to be restored renewed it's going to be uh it's going to be the, the way that god intended it for for it to be and um, so anyway, I don't know if that really answers or not. No, I, th I think that's helpful. And it brings me back to Romans chapter eight. It's something that I think about often, yeah, yeah, but yeah. the Apostle Paul is writing there. And what's amazing is Romans eight. It's book ended by you got Romans eight one. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You got the end of the chapter. There's nothing that can separate us from God now in Christ. But kind of like smack dab in the middle there. You've got these verses telling us that the creation itself is groaning with an eager anticipation. And part of what we're being told is going to happen is the new heavens and the new earth. And this is one of the great promises that we see throughout all of the Old and New Testament, that there's going to come a point where sin will be no more. Mm -hmm. Satan will be no more. Death, sickness, disease, none of these things will exist anymore in the new heavens and the new earth. But it will be better than Eden. It'll be better than what it was before Adam ever sinned, because now we have Christ as our Savior. Amen. Uh, we have him as our King. We have him as our Lord, and we will be with him where he is. And it's just such this beautiful picture that I think when you're regenerated, when you're saved, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't help but look forward to these things. And like we were saying, Christmas is a yeah. foretaste. That's right. of this heavenly glory that we are going to one day receive and be able to experience. Uh, and I don't think it matters what your eschatology is. I yeah, think this good, is yeah. what each of us is looking forward to. Yeah, that's that's fair. And that's good. And I want to be, you know, charitable. We're all looking forward to that. And you think we never get I don't know about you guys in Pennsylvania. We never hardly get a white Christmas every now and then. Every now it'll and again, happen, yeah. you know, like once a decade or something. But it's like those are the Christmases of Christmases, you know, like you, for us, you look out and like, there's just this blanket of snow on the ground. And it's like this old, dead, cold world that, um, in, in Arkansas winter anyway, I mean, like it's really ugly and gloomy and, and temperatures usually range like just above freezing. So like when you get rain, it's it's either turns into freezing rain and everybody's power goes out or, or it's just gloomy, wet, ugly all the leaves are dead but then you have this white snow 
sometimes mm-hmm. that falls and you're just like, this is beautiful. It's a reminder that creation was made for something so much more than how we treat it. And it's a reminder that God is, it's like these little promises, little reminders the Lord gives us, hey, it's not going to be this way forever. Um, and so it's it's a tremendous hope the Christian presses on in this, knowing that, uh, that yes, one day all rights, uh, all wrongs will be righted, all evil will be vanquished, justice will reign, and uh, and will glory, as the song says, uh, the Matt, is a Matt Papa, Matt Boswell song, the true and better Adam, you know, that's Christ. Uh, mm-hmm. And we rest, we rest there when in him as our King. And uh, like, I love what you said there about um, <laughs> even better than Eden as wonderful and beautiful as the first Eden was uh, things are going to be even greater. I've read the end of the book, brother. I'm talking about the Bible <laughs> and uh, things are going to be even greater there. Revelation 22. Mm-hmm. Amen. So, as we kind of wind down here and bring things to a close, I didn't know I was going to ask this question, but now I'm thinking about it. Will there be snow in the new heavens and new earth? You know, whatever the Lord wants to do, there won't be frostbite. <laughs> there won't be frostbite. Yeah, that's a good point. But I would tell you this, the Lord in his wisdom, that is a really weird thing that just came to my mind. But you saw the movie Hook, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Robin Williams. And anyway, I think if, if I remember right, like in Neverland, you know, they're there and there's like, there was like one section of snow and then one section, you know, I was like, that's odd, you know, to think that was like, who knows in the new heavens, new earth. I, I, I mean, snow is such a beautiful thing, such a, such a fun thing. And uh, I don't want to get weird here, but, but maybe, I mean, maybe, but, um, the Lord can do what he wants. Uh, I just know this, none of us, You've, you've, uh, you, you, I'm sure you've had this experience either with your kids or maybe growing up. And that is you plan this big thing, this big vacation, or or your parents were going to promise you this big thing. And you went and you're like, okay, it was great, but I just kind of, my expectations were built up too high. You know, it just didn't pan out. Well, I just tell you this, brother, you cannot build your expectations too high for the new heavens and new earth. Wherever it is that you're at, like on it, like when we see it, oh man, we're going to be be better. It's going to be better, you know? Mm -hmm. And so whether there's snow or no snow, it's going to be better than, than what we can absolutely imagine. You know, one of the things that just reminded me of is, uh, and you've, you've probably had this experience as well, but we mentioned CS Lewis earlier. I can, so I'm going to go to summer now for a second, but I can remember distinctly um, my second son, Owen, had just been born. It's month of June. Uh, Josiah is at the time uh, three years old. Was he three? Yeah, he was three. And, you know, fireflies were outside. And he was just suddenly at the age where this was now a huge deal that there were fireflies outside. So I remember handing Owen off to my wife and saying, I'm going to take Josiah outside and we're going to go catch fireflies. And it just so happened that around the same time I was le- reading C.S. Lewis's uh, biography, Surprised by Joy. And he talks in that book about having kind of like these foretastes of heaven where you're actually surprised by joy. Like you have such a joyous experience that, for lack of a better term, it's almost rapturous uh, in that it's like in that moment you're filled with so much joy, so thankful for what God has given to you that. It's this, again, it's a foretaste of heaven. And I can remember, you know, running around with him, catching these fireflies. And for a moment, it was like everything got more vibrant. The colors were more beautiful. Uh, The lightning, it was like I was a kid again, running around with my son, catching them. And I saw his face and the smile on his face. And I remember thinking to myself, this is just like a tiny little sliver of how glorious it will be to be with Christ. And as I was thanking him for my son for the lightning bugs for freshly mown grass and all mowed grass, mown grass. I don't know how you say that. <laughs> uh, thanking him for all of these different things and just thinking, you know, this is a foretaste of it. And then every Christmas, uh, maybe I'm still a child at heart, but I have that same thing. When I wake up, it's Christmas morning and there's this, this joy. And when I think back on regeneration, when I, when I study the doctrine of regeneration, it's all of these little tiny 
uh, pieces, if you will. It's not the full thing by any means, but it's these little pieces of joy, of heavenly joy that remind us what we're going to have with Christ in the new heavens, new earth is so much greater than what we can possibly imagine that it's just like that little push, that little nudge, keep pressing along, keep plodding along. What God has fixed for us is greater than we can possibly imagine. Um, so all that to say, Christmas is great and everybody should celebrate it. Uh, <laughs> what else do you want to add there to Christmas? Cause I mean, so here's the fun thing. I don't know when this is going to go live. We're recording this on October 19th. Uh, so it's early to be talking about Christmas for some people, but not for us. Uh, not and if you were to turn your camera around, you actually showed me earlier, you have the Christmas tree in, in your office. office. Uh, so as, as we think through this, any closing statements about why people should celebrate Christmas if they're regenerated? Look, I have a, I, 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 I really want to be unifying and I get it. You know, some people, I get it. Their conscience are just so frustrated right, right, right. with the commercialization of Christmas. And they're just like, absolutely not. We're not touching it. We're not putting up a tree. We're not doing any of these things. And, uh, and I want to be charitable and I want to understand that. And I, and I, I want to say, okay, brother, I, I get it. I I'm, I'm frustrated at some of the same things you are, but you know, don't throw out the beauty with, with the commercialization. Sure. For, for me, I'm kind of like, look, dude, we just, we, we just enjoy, I mean, we'll, it's not like we won't ever watch secular, like well, our family will quote elf quotes, you know I mean? Like we, we, we don't mind. I mean, like, yeah. So like, we're just like, look, people are, people are crazy and we're going to laugh at stuff sometimes too. Um, our family quotes elf year round. So that's fine. Yeah. Well, I try not so, so for like Christmas music, I try to keep it like, I try not to start listening until March 1st. And then, um, cause you know, I don't want to be too early. So we, you know, kind of do like March 1st to February 1st thing with Christmas music. So yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. So, uh, but, uh, but like, look, we, we put, when we put up our tree, we, we talk to the kids and, and we kind of rehearse this every, we put up our tree, like, okay, well, how's our tree? Like, why, why does this matter for us? Well, a few things. One, it's an evergreen tree. God is eternal. Two, it, it's shaped kind of like an arrow. It's point, pointing us upward. It's pointing us to Christ. We have lights on it because Jesus is the light of the world. It's a tree, and it reminds us that Christ died on a tree. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And then we, how we do it, we put our ornaments on it and everything that remind us of years. Like, so when we go somewhere, we'll get an ornament, you know, we'll put it up there and we'll be like, oh, y'all remember that trip and all that. And so one of the things is we remind of God's goodness to us in our family and just how he's been faithful to us over the years. And so for us, we use this as a tool to worship, as a tool to turn our our hearts and minds to christ so so i would just encourage people um thinking through christmas you've got to do what your conscience allows but like don't don't try to throw cold water on those of us who see the beauty of what uh what god has done and just the joy of of um of, of the incarnation you know mm -hmm. uh, I, i'll say one last thing about christmas too like more pastors i think should use the time of year to uh to teach such the sound theology that we have with the incarnation and the hypostatic union and um one time i taught on uh, how not to be a heretic at christmas and so we walked through you know the different understandings uh the false understandings and then the right understanding of what it means that that jesus is 100 percent god and 100 percent man one person um and two natures um so I might, I might steal that. That might be my series for uh, December this year. Go for it. So, hey, it's fun. You know how not to be a heretic. But anyway, use the time of year to build sound theology. And then just encourage. Look, there are times to mourn and there are times to fast and there are times to weep. Mm -hmm. and, and in this fallen world, it seems to me like, honestly, those times are probably the norm. You know, it's right. like. Say like there are more times to weep and mourn and bemoan the wretchedness of this fallen world and the state right. of the church and those right. things. Hey, but listen, brother, there's still times to feast. There's still times to celebrate. Our God has come and he has conquered. And it started with the with the incarnation in the in the womb of of the Virgin Mary and his birth. Like, hey, 
let's celebrate, let's feast, and let's enjoy the good gifts that God has given us. So that's my encouragement. Amen. And I hope that will be helpful to people who listen to this. Hopefully this goes up soon so that on November 1st, everybody can put up their Christmas trees, deck the holes, put out the Christmas lights. But again, our our great hope is Christ. It's not the decorations, right? These are just That's reminders, right. as Alan was just saying. Uh, brother, it's been great having you on the show today. I'm hoping and praying that this is helpful. We tackled some deep subjects, uh, but hopefully it helps people to better understand the doctrine of regeneration and what God is doing there for us. And they didn't even know that regeneration connected to Christmas, but there you go. It absolutely <laughs> yeah. does. So thank you, brother, for coming on the show today. We'll have to have you on again. Maybe maybe closer to Christmas. We can do a full-blown Christmas episode. That's when we'll you have... get the real the real Alan Nelson. You know, that's when there I come along. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. We'll have lights all over both of our office. Yeah, that, that'll be perfect. But thank you again for coming on. And until next time, to everybody else, God bless. Seated here at my right hand, the Lord to my Lord command for us.